it was the, the talk of the climate world at that time. And I looked at it and those eight wedges were comprised of 15 solutions. Uh, and those solutions what are what interested me at that time. And 11 of them could only be adopted by the boards of directors of very conservative corporations, eight utilities, one energy company, one car company, and one appliance company. Every single solution of those 11 was underwater financially, which means that we're asking boards of directors that are always more conservative than anything that they direct, uh, of very conservative companies to spend down their balance sheet and be fiduciarily irresponsible and be uh, uh, open to shareholder lawsuits. And that was 11 of the 15. As far as you and I, the only thing we could do is put a solar panel on our roof and drive less. And that was it. And what was missing there was practicality, of course, but was also missing is agency. So what about communities? What about neighborhoods? What about cities? What about towns? What about small companies? What about states? What about provinces? What about farmers? What about forest lands? What about grasslands? What about utility? I mean, the, the, the world was missing in, in that sense. And the solutions that are being proffered were basically uneconomical. Uh, one of them was to make hydrogen from coal with carbon capture systems for a non-existent hydrogen infrastructure. I mean, that was one of the solutions. And that's when I began to talk about drawdown, which is I felt like we're not having a realistic conversation about solutions. And you would think we are because there's so much talk. I think you are in Australia right now, by the way, but at that time, uh, so much talk was about clean energy, understandable. 60 to 70 percent of the emissions on the annual basis come from the combustion of fossil fuels. So, of course, we're going to talk about energy. Um, but at the same time, what I did is went around to NGOs and institutions and said, can we map, measure, and model the most substantive solutions to reversing global warming? And even then, and especially then, actually, the idea of reversal was anathema. We're you talking about reversal. We're talking about stabilization or mitigation or, you know, those are the words that were used to this day, really. And I felt that we needed to name the goal. If you don't name the goal, you're not going to achieve it. Um, and furthermore, I felt like that we had, in a sense, um, seconded, we had placed the hope or, or the, 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 the faith of the world into the hands of a very small group of people that we really didn't know, and that we were, in a sense, in a position where we hoped that they would do something. Right? Um, so, Nobody wanted to do it. Uh, everywhere I went, uh, Nature Conservancy was one of them, but <laughs> said, we don't know how to do that. And they said, why don't you do it? I said, I don't know how to do that. And for two years, I did that. And finally, I forgot about it until 2013, when Bill McKibben came out with his well-known article called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. And that article was based on Mark Campanale's work in London at Carbon Tracker. And what he did is he analyzed the balance sheets of every available coal, gas, and oil company in the world to see what their assets were. And what he said, basically, is these assets are unburnable. If we burn these assets, so-called assets, were Venus, so it doesn't make sense to say they are valuable. And what Bill did in that article was burn it. <laughs> it was burned it all. And, and it was terrifying. Absolutely. It did exactly what the article set out to do, is to terrify people. And I had friends who were activists, very good activists, come to me and say it was game over. It's over. We've done. We're finished. We lost. We tried. I'm going to go to British Columbia, raise my kids, forget about it. But literally saying the same thing even though they didn't know each other, which is to use the term game over. And from, that's when I started Drawdown. I thought, oh, come on, you know, really? How do we know that? Maybe it's true. <laughs> but we don't know that. As Professor Blow said, I mean, we, we did not, we have not actually done what Drawdown set out to do. We have not mapped, measured, and modeled the 100 most, or 50 most, or 75 most substantive solutions. Um, each of you here is here
for a reason. Why? What was that point in time? When did you become aware and decide that at least a certain part of your life was going to be devoted to this? The research, the activation, the finance, whatever it is. You know, and I had certainly known about this since 1973, uh, at Stanford Research Institute when I was there, but uh, the thing, and I want to show you this, watch out for your ears here. Um, uh, the thing that really impressed me was this. Um, And what you're about to see there is this. You're seeing basically drilling through two miles of ice to bedrock. And when they bring out these ice cores, they can put on, it's kind of like a caliper, it's really like an anode and cathode, but they can detect exactly the CO2, the pollen count, the sulfate in air bubbles in the ice. And this is research goes on all over the world. They benchmark their work with the Antarctica. Um, and what they have there is, what you come up with is something like this. This is greenhouse gases for the last 400,000 years. Pretty darn accurate measurement of what was happening um, all during that time. And that circle you see is the Eemian period. This is called the Greenland North Eemian Ice Research Station. That is exactly what they were studying. What happened 125,000 years ago? But as you can see, the uh, ppm at that time is approximately 290, 285, 290, depend. Um, and there was lions and giraffes romping over Germany. There was crocodiles moving up the British Columbia coast. There was hippopotamus breathing in the breeding in the Thames River Delta, uh, and the oceans were 20 to 30 feet higher. And at that time, it was one to two degrees Celsius higher than the pre-industrial level. We're one C right now. So this is your only come to Jesus slide of all of them. I just want to make sure you understand that. And here comes the real come to Jesus part, which is the actual PPM is not 407, it's 490 PPM right now. So the Paris Agreement talks about not exceeding 450 PPM in CO2. But when you count the global warming potential of other greenhouse gases, we're at 490. So, again, I want to go back to the language here, which is the idea that we should mitigate. I don't see mitigation on this one. Mitigation means to reduce the pain and seriousness of something. Mitigate? How? Stabilize? Where? It just doesn't make any sense. The language we're using is so flaccid, so weak, so it, it doesn't feel like a goal. When somebody says, let's mitigate, do you get excited? I mean, it just, it's just like, oh, okay, let's mitigate. You know, and um, it's not a dance. Uh, I think they meant militate, but I, I don't know. I don't know who did the translation. Um, and so you are not these people, but most people get their information about climate change this way in headlines on TV, uh, wherever, and the internet in ways that basically go to fight and flight. Basically, they shock you, going, whoa, there's the Tower Bridge going underwater, right? And, and the headlines are almost always accurate. But then what do you see next to it is clickbait, you know, which is really what this is about, about the woman who killed her husband with a frog ornament and mummified him for 18 years, you know, and you're going, and what's, the reason you click on it is because you want relief. <laughs> like, it's not fun to look at that picture and imagine what that is or when that is or what was, I mean, so you go to the clickbait, right? And the same thing here. Uh, again, this is a good study by Dr. Peter Bates at Oregon State. I don't actually agree with it, but it's a very good paper. 
and there you have 20 things you never do, never knew you could do with Coca-Cola. And actually, they're doing the right thing. Um, uh, so that's, that's the good news, you know. Um, and if you Google what you can do, any way you want to Google it, the top two sites would be scientific sites, uh, Scientific American, Union of Concerned Scientists, and you'll get a list of the ten top things you can do. I put five of each. And if you look at the one on the, on the left, you know, you look at that list, you go, okay, I want you to just try the first one for 24 hours, just try it and see how it goes, how it works for you. Um, and they're like proverbs. You know, it should be love your mother, consume less, eat smart, be efficient. I mean, it's like, yeah. Do they look like solutions to you, of their behaviors? And then the one on the right, you know, put a power strip in your home entertainment center. Wow. Do you have to get one first, you know, and then you can put a power strip in it. Um, so what happens is, if, if as an individual, you see the headlines, you hear the news, it's about fear, it's about threat, it's about doom, it's about the future, it's about holy smokes, and then you see these lists of what you can do as an individual, and unless you have an IQ lower than room temperature, you know that this isn't adequate to the task at hand. You know, okay, well, I'll try some of these, but uh, we're, we're cooked. And what happens to people like that? They feel guilty, disempowered, they feel numb, they disengage, they've got a mortgage, they've got a job, one of the kids is acting up, the mother has Alzheimer's, I mean, whatever, and they're saying, and now I've got to reverse global warming or mitigate it, whatever it is. It's too much. It's too much. You know, and this goes to communication. The most serious problem, the most serious thing is, is it, it beggars the, the word that's needed here. The most incredible crisis human civilization has ever faced. And this is, we, we're communicating in such a way that 99, literally, 0.99% of the people, not here, but in the world, are completely disengaged from this problem. Completely. Go to Botswana, try it, go to Belgium. I was at Bank Australia, by the way, yesterday, lovely group of people, and I was talking about that, and I said, go down to the street after you leave and ask every single person you see, what does two degrees Celsius mean to you? And if they say, I don't know what you're talking about, say, two degrees Celsius in 2050, what does that mean to you? And they'll say, well, what are you talking about? Well, we shouldn't exceed two degrees Celsius in 2050. What does that mean to you? Nothing. It means nothing at all. And yet that's the language we're using. Scientifically, it makes sense, scientist to scientist. No question. Science to the public, it doesn't work. So where do we stand? We created a project drawdown. We had no money. Funders came to us. We told them what we're going to do, and they said, I think they were skeptical, frankly, and they said, well, show us when you're done. <laughs> Maybe we'll fund you. <laughs> and so we turned to people like Delton. We put the word out to educational institutions all over the world. This is one of them for research fellows. And what we got was hundreds of applications, um, White House fellows, Fulbright scholars, um, uh, Rhodes Scholars, Aga Khan Award winners, some of these people at 27 have better CVs than I have all, still. I mean, extraordinary human beings, half PhDs, almost half women, uh, and that is the core research group of Project Rada. 22 countries, six continents, um, uh, all the major religions. It's, it's just, just an extraordinary group of people, and we did this through Zoom.net basically, uh, at all hours of day and night. Um, and we added 120 advisors, um, some of whom you may recognize here. Um, and uh, they advised on the content, the book itself, uh, but also on the data. And we also added 40 outside scientific uh, 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 peer re reviewers of the models. We have about four or five or six, I'm not sure, uh, IPCC lead authors uh, as our advisors as well. You have some right here sitting in the room, by the way. And what do we do 
is we do math. And, and to give an example, here's geothermal. So the math we did, uh, Professor Blows is correct, is on the, on the greenhouse side, on the carbon side, or greenhouse gas uh, uh, CO2 equivalent side, we use peer-reviewed science only. And where there is a divergence in the science, which you do see a lot in land use, uh, we did a sensitivity analysis to use the low median number. Okay. On the economic side, we use the IEA, the International Energy Agency, the World Bank, the FAO, IPCC, Bloomberg Energy. So all the data that you see in the book or you'll see tonight, none of it is our data. Really important to understand. We didn't create anything. The only thing we did is we modeled solutions that are in place at hand. We know how to do them. There is the science. And they're all scaling. In other words, it's not like we should do these things. We are doing them. Everyone you see, we are doing and doing very well, by the way. And what we did was we continued to scale them over 30 years to 2050 to see if we could achieve drawdown that point in time when greenhouse gases peak and go down on a year-to-year -year basis. That was our task. We had no idea what we would see, by the way, which is why it was so much fun. So what you see is a ranking by the amount of gigatons of CO2 or CO2 equivalent reduced, avoided using this technology, or sequestered in the case of land use. And it was brought back home. And what you see on the bottom is the net cost and operating savings over 30 years. That was compared to a business as usual scenario, which is what would you do if you didn't do this where it's implementable, where geothermal is implementable, you decide not to do it, you're going to do coal or combined cycle gas to produce electricity and in this case, it saves money. So that you see a net, you see a, a minus. The profit over 30 years is $1.0 trillion. So now I'm going to go through the solutions just quickly to give you a sense of the, the diversity of solutions. This is afforestation, putting trees where there hasn't been trees before. Um, this is high-speed rail. The Japanese and Chinese now own this one. They were very slow in, in the U.S., Really important solution, indigenous people's land management. We gave thanks to the original inhabitants. Indigenous is the adjective of indigene, the noun. Indigene means the original inhabitant of the land. And it turns out that those people know the most about that land. <laughs> and they know how to manage it. You know, surprise, surprise. And um, in this case, the, the salient number... Uh, this is a Kayapo in uh, Brazil, um, is the amount of CO2, a carbon equivalent, that they reside on in terms of biomass and, and the soil. And it's more than it's in the, in the atmosphere itself. So, very, very important. Um, this is improved rice production, um, a 50% reduction in methane, um, and there's two ways to do it. It doesn't cost anything. It improves productivity. Um, and uh, it only takes a farmer going across his or her paddy and teaching the next farmer. There's no special equipment needed or anything. Um, this is onshore wind. Um, look at the bottom right-hand figure. Again, the numbers were all chosen to be very conservative, both on the economic side and on uh, the um, carbon side. Uh, offshore, um, this is an Uru woman in Lake Titicaca, straw uh, house on a straw island uh, with her two daughters. Her smile has to do with the fact that uh, she was using kerosene to light the straw hut at night for her daughters to do homework. And it underlines a point about 99 of the 100 solutions are things we'd want to do if there wasn't the climate scientist alive and we were clueless as to whether 
uh, that what the cause of extreme weather uh, is. We would want to do all 99 of them. They have so many benefits uh, for us and for other creatures and for the future and our children, for jobs, for prosperity, for pure air, for clean water. For, it, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, so it's not like, oh, we should do these because we're worried about uh, the atmosphere. We should do them for a lot of reasons. And guess what? They absolutely together can achieve drawdown. This is rooftop solar. Uh, this is women small holders. Why are they here? Uh, women produce, uh, or 40 percent of the small holders in the world are women. 70 uh, percent of the world's food is produced by small holders. I, I don't know about you, I started in the organic food business when I was 20. And I swear for 10, 15 years or longer, I, I was blamed and, and, and shamed because, you know, the idea that if everybody grew their food organically, the world would starve. And if you're going to feed the world, you have to have industrial agriculture. And who do you hippies think you are anyway with your special food and all that sort of stuff? It's just amazing the propaganda that came out of, the, of, of big ag and big food. Well, let's look at the data, which is what we did. Big ag produces 25% of the world's food. All right? What is it? Corn and soy for pigs and cows, for McDonald's. Huh. OK. And oil for hydrogenated fats, sugar for obesity and type 2 diabetes. Uh, the, actually, what big ag produces is big pharma. Stroke, heart disease, like I say, diabetes. It produces the foods that are making us sick. It produ sick. It produces ultra-processed foods. It's producing the basis for disease. Women are producing 40% times 70 is 28%. Women are producing more food than big ag. Right now. Who knew? That's why we love doing the math, which is, who knew? If they get the same support as men in terms of seeds, tools, uh, and, and education, they are produced the men by 10 to 15 percent. And if we do that, then what you see here and the carbon number basically is avoided deforestation. In other words, we don't cut down trees to make more farms. Uh, and again, so I think when you expand the range of where you're looking for solutions for addressing uh, global warming, you enter into these fantastic and fascinating areas that are social, that are gender-based in this case, uh, uh, but include so much of what's left out when you hear Al Gore say the solution is solar and wind and solar and wind and Elon Musk. That's what he does. He went to Davos, he's at TED, he's, yeah, that's what he says. You know. And, and like, as if we did that, we'd get a hall pass to the 22nd century, you know, I'm going, that's not true. Those are crucial solutions, but that's a scientific howler. It's not true. It's not going to work. But we absolutely need those things, you know. Um, great bear forest, forest protection, again, the same number, bottom right, very, very important. Plant-rich diet. Reduce the protein in developed countries, so-called rich countries, to a healthy level, 50 to 55 grams. Move some of that to pro, uh, animal, a plant-based protein. Uh, uh, stop eating things that crawl so much and that walk. Um, and increase the amount of protein in the world where they have insufficient amount. And it comes out to the number four solution. It also does a great, great kindness to not only your body, but the body of the Earth in terms of CAFOs. Uh, there's 3.3 uh, ruminants in the world, sheep and cows, that we are uh, being bred to um, produce what I saw last night in Melbourne, which is night market. Uh, I went there to get my dinner. I couldn't find any vegetarian food. It was all meat, smoking and barbecued and pigs and everything, gyros and so forth. I mean... You know, we can do that, but if we do that, it's a great, great expense to the planet. This is regenerative agriculture, um, which is agriculture based on restoring the health of the soil. You can't restore the uh, health without in, uh, increasing the carbon level. Life is carbon, so the health of the soil depends on that life. 
the most important technique to do this um, is to stop plowing and disking, to stop breaking the cover of the soil. You don't see that in nature. You see it only in farming. Um, a lot could be said about this. This is food waste. Number three solution, 40 plus percent of all food in the United States is thrown away. It's thrown away either um, in the restaurant, it's thrown away at home, um, or it goes into the refrigerator where food goes to die, mostly. Um, and um, you clean it out every so often, you know. And um, this does not include methane production of landfill food, because when food or any green waste goes to an anaerobic environment, it produces methane, which is 35 times more powerful uh, greenhouse gas than uh, CO2. And, and finally, uh, there's 20 what we call coming attractions in the book. And these are solutions that are valid scientifically. There's no science peer-reviewed literature on them yet. There's no economic literature. Um, but we put them in there because I want to give our reader a sense that humanity is brilliant, <laughs> ingenious, that we're on the case, that we're not just doing the things we know how to do. We are doing those things, of course. Um, but we have incredible imaginations in that, that millions of people care about this and are trying things, and engineers and inventors and people on the land, people on the ocean, are inventing extraordinary means to reduce emissions and sequester carbon. This is one of them. These are PET frames, recycled PET in oceans. PET doesn't break down in salt water. Don't know why. Um, and with a tube going down to the thermocline, which is actuated by the rise and fall of the sea or the ocean. And the thermocline is where the nutrient-laden waters are. We're in a situation now uh, in the tropical oceans where 99% of them are, are marine deserts. There's no life in them whatsoever. And partly that's due, uh, not, uh, they, they weren't all, they were marine deserts, uh, I mean, for a long time, but not to the degree, to the degree they are now. And the uh, reason for that is that 93% of the heat from global warming is going into the oceans, and, and that's producing heat blankets. Uh, we had that in California a few years ago, and a massive die-off of the pinniped population because um, there's no food. The, the circulation patterns were interrupted. Um, so what this does is restart them, and in uh, four or five weeks, you get, you know, phytoplankton, zooplankton, you get algae, you get kelp, which sequesters carbon faster than any plant uh, above or below the water. Uh, and you get feeder fish, forage fish, you get whale sharks in six weeks when this was placed uh, uh, north of Hawaii. Um, in other words, you get regeneration. The ocean will regenerate itself given the conditions, the right conditions. And what it does is cools the water and deacidifies it. So it can be used to reverse coral bleaching if done in a significant way. Um, it's one of these is down in the Tasman Sea right now. This is repopulating the mammoth steppe, which is putting animals back in the Arctic Circle where they once were. We extirpated, we being Homo sapiens, um, and 12,000 years ago. Um, and what they do if they're there, the musk ox and the buffalo and the wolves and the reindeer, the, mus the woolly mammoth, we can't get back. Um, uh, is brush away the snow in the winter to get at the browse so they can eat when it's minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> I mean, it's so cold there. Um, and these animals can withstand it, but they have to eat. When they brush away the snow, it reduces the temperature of this, the ground by 2 degrees Celsius. So it's a permafrost protection plan, basically. Well, it's, just, it's so brilliant. Again, bringing back what was there and... In, 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 we all benefit from that. This is building with wood. There's a 10-story building in Melbourne built with wood. A 90-story building is going up in London. They are as safe or safer than steel and concrete buildings because wood does not burn. It chars. These, these 
You, you think, oh, it's going to go up like that. It will not actually go up like Greenfell or the Torch Tower in Dubai. It will not do that. It just won't do it. Um, and so there's a whole branch of architecture starting called carbon architecture, which is treating not just buildings, but what about building cities that sequester carbon? In other words, that actually draw it down. You know, and Interface, a company um, uh, that's here in Australia, but in the United States, is now building in Australia a factory like a forest. And what did they do is they measured the ecosystem services, the oxygen, the CO2 sequestered, the biodiversity, water retention, etc., prior to building the factory. And the goal is that after it's done and completed, ecosystem services will equal or surpass what was there before. This is the new design, basically, charter. This is what the best architects and, and landscape architects are looking at right now, is designing human habitat, that's what a city is, and building such that when you're done, you're better off in terms of the services that nature provided than when you started. Right? It's possible. We go in alignment with nature as opposed to conflicting it. This uh, solution is really about ruminants. It was a discovery made um, in Queensland by a scientist uh, who um, identified Asparagopsis taxiformis, uh, an algae, seaborne algae, uh, that are fed as a 2 or 3% supplement to ruminants will reduce methane emissions by 70 to 90%. And there's people all over this, and from Stanford to, gosh, in the United States, all over, everybody's excited about this. Uh, there are some challenges in terms of keeping it active after you dry it, you know. Uh, and then the marine permaculture people are talking to them about how to grow it, you know, under the ocean as a crop or as, you know, and can you imagine if you can and if you had carbon pricing and carbon credits, uh, um, you just, 11% of the emissions are caused by ruminants. Um, so some people say higher, some people say lower, but approximately that. I, what, what surprised us, um, we didn't know what the data would show. And we didn't know until the end because the solutions are modeled as a system. You can't model solutions in silos. You can, but it won't be good data. Um, and what surprised us was that the food sector was the biggest sector. And we're going, you know, and why? And well, food is, is actually, with transport, the biggest emitter when you count not just CO2, but nitrous oxide and methane. Um, but when you change the agricultural methods, uh, it can be the biggest sequesterer. In other words, it can sequester uh, CO2, so it can flip it. Transport, you look at the right there, you think, wow, transport with EVs and all that sort of stuff would be uh, uh, right up there. But it's not, because what we use is business-as-usual scenarios from the World Bank and IPCC and IEA to model against. And what they project is the number of, of vehicles in the world will go from 1 to 2 billion by 2050. We have to use that data. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's true. But this wasn't about what we think. It was about um, what's going on. The top solutions, refrigerant management, um, we were so disappointed. <laughs> we were like, no, it can't be. It's so unsexy. And yet, there it was. Refrigerants, the gases are, you know, two, three, four, five, nine thousand times more powerful than CO2 and their uh, global warming potential. And they're released with impunity all over the world, except in countries like Denmark and Australia and US, where they're decommissioned properly, mostly. But in China, in Asia, Africa, um, as soon as they're recycled, the, the gases are released. Nobody's really capturing the gases uh, and decommissioning them. The number six solution is educating girls. Uh, and why? Because when you pull girls out, which tens of millions of girls are pulled out of school at puberty to go to work for their brother's schooling or to uh, be married off, early marriage. 
and they have an average of five plus children, if she's allowed to matriculate to high school and uh, she becomes a woman on more or less her own terms instead of somebody else's, and she does um, chooses a very different reproductive level, which is two, she has better education, she can put more resources into those children, uh, they repeat her behavior. Um, and so this is a pathway to family planning. And the other pathway to family planning is family planning. Uh, um, and this uh, solution is clinics available to all women everywhere to support their reproductive health and well-being. Um, and both of them together, um, if you look at those two numbers, they're actually the same number, 119.2 gigatons. This is the difference. Uh, but this is a UN number, not our numbers. The difference between the high and median population in 2050, those projections. And it's almost entirely due to family planning. Um, and so that's why uh, these two, you put them together, it's the number one solution, it is the empowerment of girls and women. It's so interesting, I was at University of Santa Cruz and a professor uh, stood up in the Q&A and said, yeah, yeah, but how do we control population? It's like, I'll, I said, well, you weren't listening. Um, <laughs> I said, lose the verb. Control, stop it. It's empower. It's like this thing, it's such a male thing. Anyway, sorry. Um, so here are the three scenarios. And the plausible scenario is we just, remember we scaled things? We just scaled them. We didn't know what it was going to come out to be. Well, it doesn't achieve drawdown. Okay, it does not. It's quite short. So then we did a drawdown scenario. We wanted to achieve drawdown by 2050, and you can see we increased then the scaling of most solutions uh, reasonably, in some cases aggressively, and we had drawdown 2050. Then we did an optimum scenario where we just said, well, this is go for it, and we have drawdown in, 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 in 2045. This is what the solutions look like in a pie chart, and the reason I show this is that the, the, we have this sort of tendency to focus on the big solutions. Now, uh, we shouldn't. We should focus on all of them. There's no such thing as a small solution, because we need them all. So the solutions that matter are the ones that matter to you. That's what you should be working on. People say, what should I do? They ask, what should I do? You know, I say, if I answer that question, you should run. We just met. I have no idea what you should do. You know, that's silly. But you do. And one of the things about looking at the book or looking at the website, you have to buy the book, look at the website, look for those things where you go, wow, I want to know more. I do know more. Or I want to get involved. Or, I want to work outside. Or I love girls. Or whatever it is, that's what you should do. Don't worry about the other ones. People will find those by themselves. And so again, there's no such thing as a small solution. A system causes this. It's causing it. It's a system that heals it. And the, the title is so brash and cheeky. I apologize for that. It was suggested by a Stanford intern at the publisher. But you know, it is the most comprehensive plan uh, ever proposed because no one's proposed one, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> So we just took the high ground and hoping that somebody will take it away from us. That would be really great, you know. Um, but the most important thing is it's not our plan. It's not our plan. It's our plan. I, I want you to see Drawdown as a we, 200 plus people, extraordinary people who got together, collaborated, worked together, listened to each other from all over the world, worked hard for pauper's wages, and came together and created Drawdown. It's a we. We were a we, and we feel we still are, and we're connected, but it's we talking to the bigger we. You're the we. It's us talking to each other. What Drawdown is, is what we know, what we're doing. That's what it is. So it's not like some charismatic white male vertebrate in California saying, I have a plan, you know? I mean, we've had enough of white charismatic male vertebrates having a plan in this world. That's the problem. It's not the solution. And, and that's why the diversity of the people involved was so important to us. It happened spontaneously, by the way. We didn't have to make it happen. 
It's innate in this planet, <laughs> diversity, just like it is in nature. And so this is the collective wisdom of humanity. Now, is it sufficient under the day? No. When you look at the science, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And are we at this pace and acceleration that we can prevent catastrophic climatic changes? No. No. Science is absolutely right about that. But, um, I'm going to skip this one. But, if we're going to do this, if we're going to come together, we have to change the way we're talking to each other. We have to change the language. This is the language we're using. Fight, combat, you know, the, gosh, climate crusade. That is a really unfortunate term. Has anybody read history? I mean, the, the climate battle, you know, slashing emissions with our carbon machetes, you know, I mean, Curbing climate change in New York, you've been there, you curb your dog. It says everywhere, you curb your dog. You're not going to curb climate change, you know. The carbon war room, that's Richard Branson, RMI, you know, negative emissions. What does that mean? I'm an English major. It doesn't mean anything. And decarbonization, as if that was the solution. That's the name of the problem. We took carbon here and we put it up there. We decarbonized the earth with our agricultural methods and our combustion of fossil fuels. That is not the solution. Recarbonization is the name of the solution. But the most important thing about this language is that, to, to note, is that basically we're objectifying the climate. First of all, you can't fight climate change. You can think it, but you, what are you going to do? Don Quixote, the climate changes every nanosecond. It's supposed to change. It's a blessing. It's fantastic. Thank God it changes. I'm going to fight it? Really? And so, the, again, the language, I know what the intention is, and so do you, but what is the intention when you start to say fight, combat, battle? The problem with that is that you're making it other. You're objectifying life. You're objectifying this extraordinary, miraculous place we call Earth and saying part of it is a problem. No, it's not. We're the problem. It's fine. And that objectification is the disease. It's the disease of this world today. We objectify women, okay? That's come out finally, but we've always done that. We objectify other religions. Right? In the United States, Muslims. We objectify Mexicans. We objectify anybody we think is less than us. That is a disease. That is not going to be the mental state that solves the problem. To think about the atmosphere or the climate is other. It is a blessing. Climate change, as it's called, but global warming, and I want to say this, is a blessing. It's a gift. It's not a curse. Why? Because it's a system. This earth is an extraordinary system. Who knows when we'll ever understand even 10% of it. <laughs> it's so amazing. You know, Professor Pasenev is a, is a birder, you know, and, and when, when will you ever figure out, you know, what birds do and how they communicate? And it's just, it's just endless. I'm a birder too. It's like, it's like, it's just extraordinary, you know. And any system that denies feedback and, and basically ignores it, perishes. Absolutely. And so this is feedback, and it's feedback to inspire us to reimagine what it means to a human being, and what it means to a human being at this point in time, in civilization, and to reimagine what it means to be an architect, an engineer, a student, a farmer, a forester, a wife, a child. Uh, to, to be all the things that we are, you know, it means can we look at it in an entirely new way? And when you name the goal, which is to reverse global warming, it doesn't make it more difficult, it makes it easier because it opens it up. 
It opens up creativity. When you think this is happening to you, like it's a curse, oh my God, you know, how unlucky I was to be born now. You know, I didn't do this. I'm not responsible. When you think of yourself as a victim, as an object, you were disempowered. But when you think about this as something that's happening for us, then you take 100% responsibility. You stop blaming people. You honor the science. The IPCC is two and a half billion data points behind the last fifth assessment, the fifth assessment. It is the most astounding problem statement that humanity has ever created. Extraordinary. But you don't solve a problem by repeating the problem over and over and over again to each other. You solve a problem by looking at the possibilities that are inherent in that problem. And that's what Drawdown's about. Thank you so much.